Hello everyone, my name is Mudud Gupta. So in this lesson, we would discuss the International Court of Justice, which has recently been in news because of the election of Mr. Dalvir Bhandari, Justice Dalvir Bhandari to the International Court of Justice. So we would be looking at this organization holistically, this particular judicial organ of United Nations. Also, we would be discussing what are the different contours, what is the relevance, what is the jurisdiction, what are the relationship between countries and, you know, how... The judgments have been passed by this particular court over a course of years. So we would be discussing this organization in detail, covering all the aspects relevant from the prelims as well as from the mains point of view. So first of all, I would be focusing more on the factual part. And after that, once the factual part is over, I would be moving on towards the more subjective and more debatable part. This is something about me. So as far as the International Court of Justice is concerned, so this particular judicial organ of the United Nations was established in 1945 by the Charter of United Nations. So you must be knowing that the Charter of United Nations was passed in 1945 and it came into existence on 22nd October 1945. Since then, the International Court of Justice came into the picture and it was established at The Hague, Netherlands and it replaced the Permanent Court of International Justice. So this uh, before International Court of Justice, there was this global judicial organization by the name of permanent court of international justice and this was replaced by international court of justice this international court of justice started working in 1946 and it is also known as the world court if we talk about the composition of this particular judicial organ then it has 15 judges it has a bench of 15 judges and each of these judge has a term of nine years and the five judges are elected after every three years. So this is just like Rajya Sabha that one third of the members retire every two years. Similarly here that one third of the members retire every three years. So basically elections takes place after every three years. Now, the point that arises here is that who nominates the judges? Like there was this contest between Justice Dalvir Bhandari and Justice Christopher Greenwood of United Kingdom. So basically who nominated them? Is it the government of the day or the United Nations General Assembly or the Security Council? Who nominates these judges? So there is this group by the name of National Group at the Permanent Court of Arbitration that nominates these judges. So. Permanent Court of Arbitration is another court that is situated in Netherlands in Hague only near the International Court of Justice and there are national groups. So let us say there is one group of India, one group of let us say Pakistan, one group of United Kingdom, one group of United States, one group of China. So there are groups of diplomats of different countries or judicial officers maybe. So uh, these are national groups that represent each country at this permanent court of arbitration and these groups are of maximum strength of four. That that is, if there is a national group of India, then there would be at most four members in that particular group. And those four members would nominate the Indian member for the International Court of Justice for the election to the position of the judge of the International Court of Justice. So it is a national groups of the Permanent Court of Arbitration that nominate the person for the election to the International Court of Justice. So it was the Indian National Group of the Permanent Court of Arbitration that nominated Justice Dalvir Bhandari for election to International Court of Justice. Now if we talk about, we have seen how the members are nominated and what is the strength of the judges, what is the term of the judges. Now we would come to the election part, how these judges are actually elected. Now, once the name has been nominated by the National Group of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, then you know, there are different nominations there may be any number of nominations and so this time in this time's election there were five vacancies and six nominations so basically six national groups of the permanent court of arbitration uh, you know nominated their own representatives so election took place and as far as the election is concerned so the simultaneous election takes place in the United Nations Security Council as well as the United Nations General Assembly. So simultaneous election takes place and the winning candidate requires majority in both the houses that is in the United Nations Security Council and even the United Nations General Assembly. So in United Nations Security Council, there are 15 members, five permanent and 10 non-permanent. So you need at least 
eight votes in the United Nations Security Council to get elected and at the same time there is you know there is uh, not conditional this is an and situation basically that both of them are uh, both of them need to be satisfied and then only the election would be made that is you need to get at least eight votes in the United Nations Security Council and the strength of the United Nations General Assembly is 193, which means that you need to get at least 97 votes in the United Nations General Assembly. So if you are getting 8 votes in UNSC and 97 votes at least in United Nations General Assembly, then only you would be elected to the International Court of Justice. That is, you need to have majority in both the houses and not one. You know, you cannot say that, look, I have majority in United Nations Security Council, but I don't have majority in General Assembly. So let me get elected to ICJ. No, you need to have simultaneous majority in both the houses. Also, one of the important points that you should note here is that there is no veto in the election to International Court of Justice. That is, let us say if there is Justice Dal uh, Dalvir Bhandari who is to be elected to ICJ. Now, if the voting is taking place in United Nations Security Council, then China cannot go and veto his nomination. China cannot go and say, look, uh, we uh, do not have cordial terms with India. So we would be vetoing the nomination of the of Justice Dalbir Vandari. So basically, there is no veto as far as the case, uh, election to the International Court of Justice is concerned. Also, one of the most important points that you need to keep in mind is that no two judges can belong to the same country. That is, the strength of the International Court of Justice is 15 and all the 15 judges need to belong to different country. They cannot belong to the same country. And so basically one country would have one judge. Also, one of the you know it is not basically written anywhere but one of the convention that has been observed since 1945 is that all the five permanent members of the united nations security council have been represented at the international court of justice this is for the first time that uh, britain would not be represented since 1945 otherwise uh, in the past 71 72 years of history britain has always given a judge to the international court of justice also there was this short duration between 1967 to 1985 when there was no judge from China. China didn't uh, you know nominate its own representative. So these are some of the exceptions when permanent members didn't have representation at the International Court of Justice. Otherwise Otherwise, uh, one point is that all the five permanent members have been represented at the International Court of Justice. Also you know, just in favor of this particular veto point that there is no veto in elections. Had this been the case, then, you know, since this particular case that we are talking about belongs to the contest between the Indian representative and the Britain representative, then had this been the case, had the veto been in the picture, then Britain would have vetoed the uh, nomination of the Indian member that is Justice Dalvir Bhandari and India would not have been able to, you know, send its own representative to the International Court of Justice. So, this is another point in favor of the fact that no veto can be used as far as the election to the Office of International Court of Justice is concerned. So more I would continue in the next lesson. So in the previous lesson, we have seen the strength of the judges of the International Court of Justice, the nomination procedure, the election process and how one country would have only one judge in the 15 uh, ben uh, judges bench at the International Court of Justice. Now there is one more concept that is associated with the ad hoc judges. Uh, uh, basically, these are the judges in the International Court of Justice that are appointed by the contesting party. Let us just understand this with an example. For example, the current Kulbushan Jadav case uh, in uh, at the International Court of Justice is between India and Pakistan. Now, India has a judge Justice Dalvir Bhandari. So he is representing India in that particular uh, bench. Now, Pakistan may have some apprehensions that since Justice Dalvir Bhandari represents India, so he may be taking up the case of India in a more better manner or he may be influencing uh, the proceedings of the International Court of Justice in favor of India. So this particular International Court of Justice says that if there is any country who wants 
its own representative on the bench of the judges then uh, that particular country can appoint the ad hoc judges so in the case of kulbushan jadav if pakistan wants to appoint an ad hoc judge then let us just consider that if all the 15 judges are listening to that particular case are hearing that case of kulbushan jadav then pakistan may has its own uh, ad hoc judge on the panel and then the strength of the international court of justice would become 16 for that particular case only so basically ad hoc judge is a provision that has been provided to the contesting countries so that they may feel more assured of the justice process the judicial process they may feel more assured of the proceedings that are taking place and also the ad hoc judge would be such that he would be representing the case of that particular country in a more you know in a more holistic manner he would be making other judges understand the ground realities in that particular country so if pakistan decides to appoint an ad hoc judge in the kulbushan jadav case then he may you know actually try and make uh, other judges understand what is the ground uh, reality in pakistan what are the laws of pakistan he would add more nuances to the judicial thought process that would be going in the minds of rest of the judges in the panel so basically ad hoc judges are not permanent judges per se but these are the judges that are appointed that may be appointed by the contesting parties so that all their fears and apprehensions can be contained So let us say that there is some case between Pakistan and Bangladesh okay now both these countries don't have any representation in the international court of justice so both of them can appoint one ad hoc judge each and so the maximum strength of the uh, bench can become 17 that is one judge would be representing the case of Pakistan and one judge would be representing the case of Bangladesh now this won't have much impact on the judgment because you know if the judge of uh, if the ad hoc judge of Pakistan is delivering the justice in favor of pakistan then the uh, ad hoc judge of bangladesh would be delivering the justice in favor of bangladesh so that would cancel the judgment of each other so this is the concept of ad hoc judges that these are appointed just to allay all the uh, allay all the apprehensions and you know reduce all the fears of the contesting parties to the particular case now if we talk about the specific case of dalveer bhandari and christopher greenwood so what happened in this case was dalveer bhandari was the representative of india he was nominated by the national group the indian national group of the permanent court of arbitration and christopher greenwood was nominated by the uk uh, national group of the permanent court of arbitration now several rounds of voting took place between these two justices uh, these two judges Now as I told you earlier that the majority is required both in the security council and general assembly for a person to get elected to international court of justice. So in this particular case what exactly happened was Justice Dalveer Bhandari secured clear cut majority in the United Nations General Assembly whereas Justice Christopher Greenwood uh, attained the majority in the United Nations Security Council. So one person was getting majority only at one place. However, you know both of them needed to have majority in both the cases that is if one is to get elected then he should have majority in both the houses of the united nations so 11 rounds of voting were undertaken 11 rounds were conducted and in all the 11 rounds justice dalveer bhandari secured clear cut majority in the general assembly whereas justice christopher greenwood uh, attained the clear cut majority in united nations security council so what happened exactly was that united kingdom proposed a mechanism that is a joint conference mechanism joint conference mechanism is a mechanism that has been prescribed in the statute of the international court of justice and the, uh, that is one mechanism that has not been used since 1946 so it has never been used since the international court of justice came into existence basically as per that particular joint conference mechanism six members are to, are to be elected six countries are to be elected for a joint conference three would be from the united nations security council and three would be from the united nations general assembly so basically six countries would undergo a joint conference mechanism to elect a particular candidate for uh, international court of justice but so this joint conference mechanism is perfectly a legal way a perfectly you know uh, 
perfectly valid way but that was not resorted to because of one of the constraint and one constraint is that how these six countries of the joint conference mechanism would be elected because even though the statute to the international court of justice mentions about this joint conference mechanism but it does not mention the process the procedure as to how these six countries would be elected so basically that would have led to some sort of biasness because uh, united kingdom being a more powerful country being a more influential country as far as the united nations is concerned so it would have elected those six members that would have favored its own election so basically because of these apprehensions uh, that particular joint conference mechanism was never uh, considered and it was only after 11 rounds of voting that united kingdom actually pulled out its own name because seeing Seeing the response in the United Nations uh, General Assembly, it was pretty evident that the voice of the globe is that the Indian candidate should be elected. So the joint conference mechanism was actually neglected. As far as the result is concerned, so after 11 rounds and before the 12th round of voting started, United Kingdom pulled out. So then Justice Dalvir Bhandari was elected undisputedly. He was elected without any opposition for the fifth seat of the International Court of Justice. So as I told you that five judges are elected after every three years. So four vacancies were filled and this contest between Justice Dalvir Bhandari and Justice Christopher Greenwood was for the fifth position and once Justice Christopher Greenwood actually pulled out of the contest then justice dalvir bhandari of india was elected unopposed and he secured votes of all the 15 members a uh, vote of all the 15 members of the united nations security council and also 182 to 183 members of the united nations general assembly so out of the 193 members of the united nations general assembly more than 180 members voted in favor of justice dalvir bhandari and as i told you as i have already told you that this has been a convention that all the five permanent members of the united nations security council have been represented on the international court of justice uh, since 1945-1946 but this is the first time since 1946 that Britain would not have any judge at the uh, you know this international court of justice and so this is the first time more aspects I would be covering in the next lesson So till now we have talked about the election to the uh, International Court of Justice, what is the strength, what are the different nominations that are being made and what is the recent controversy, recent issue between Justice Dalvir Bhandari and Justice Christopher Greenwood from Britain. Now uh, uh, if we talk about the parties to the International Court of Justice, that who all are the parties to the International Court of Justice, then all the United Nations members are you know ipso facto that is automatically members of the international court of justice they are the parties to the international court of justice so currently united nations has now 193 members so all these 193 countries all these 193 members are parties to the international court of justice however if some country is not a member of uh, united nations then also it can become the member of the international court of justice by following a separate procedure that has been mentioned in the statute to the international court of justice but one of the points that you should keep here in mind is that even if you are a party to the international court of justice then also the jurisdiction of the international court of justice won't apply to you automatically so there is a difference between being a party to international court of justice and difference between the jurisdiction of the international court of justice for example let us say if india is a party to international court of justice because india is a member to united nations but whether India comes under the jurisdiction of International Court of Justice or not, that is altogether a different matter and that we would see how that is decided. If we talk about the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, then it has threefold jurisdiction. That is three kinds of jurisdictions are there. One is the contentious jurisdiction, another is the incidental jurisdiction and third is the advisory jurisdiction. If we talk about the contentious jurisdiction, then all the parties just focus on the words i am using the term party here it means that either the country is you know the party to the icj by uh, by virtue of being a united nation member or if it is not a united nation member then it would have signed the membership the part uh, you know it would have signed a protocol it would have undergone a procedure to become a party to the international court of justice that we have seen in this uh, particular slide 
so as far as the contentious jurisdiction is concerned so it is that kind of a jurisdiction in which the decision that is given by the international court of justice is binding in nature so if a country wants to come under the contentious jurisdiction of the international court of justice then they need to sign a special undertaking they need to sign a special protocol they need to sign a special agreement saying that you know we are a party to inter uh, international court of justice and we accept the contentious jurisdiction of the international court of justice which means that all the judgments of the international court of justice would be binding on both the parties basically if contentious jurisdiction of the uh, icj is to apply then both the contesting parties should come under the contentious jurisdiction that is both of them should sign the protocol the agreement accepting that all the judgments would be binding in nature if this particular contentious agreement is not signed uh, if this particular protocol is not signed then the judgments of the international court of justice will not be binding on that particular country let us say if there is a case between india and new zealand let us say and both the countries have not signed this particular protocol this contentious protocol then all the judgments that would be given by the international court of justice would not be binding in nature however if both india and new zealand have signed this particular contentious protocol this agreement accepting the jurisdiction or the contentious jurisdiction of the international court of justice then all the judgments of the international court of justice would be binding in nature so there are two kinds of uh, you know judgments one is the binding judgment that would come under the contentious jurisdiction and another is the non binding judgment so as far as the contentious judgment is concerned so it means that india has signed the particular protocol the set of rules and because of which all the judgments of the international court of justice are binding on india if we talk about the kulbushan jadhav case that is lying pending in the international court of justice between india and pakistan then that comes under the contentious jurisdiction which means that india and pakistan both the countries have signed this particular protocol they have signed this particular agreement that all the judgments of the international court of justice would be binding in nature so whatever decision is uh, you know conveyed in the case of kulbushan jadhav then that would be uh, acceptable and that would be binding on both the parties whether it is in favor of pakistan or in favor of india had uh, one of these countries not signed uh, this particular contentious jurisdiction clause this particular protocol then the judgment of the icj would not have been binding in nature if you talk about the second kind of uh, jurisdiction that is the incidental jurisdiction the incidental jurisdiction is that jurisdiction that allows the court to pass interim orders and these interim orders are also binding in nature so again india and pakistan both come under the incidental jurisdiction of the you know, international court of justice because recently the international court of justice had passed this interim order staying the execution of kulbushan jadhav that was binding on pakistan as well as india so this shows that india and pakistan both comes under the incidental jurisdiction because this particular inter the order that has been passed by the international court of justice was followed and was binding on both the nations third is the advisory jurisdiction now advisory jurisdiction is that jurisdiction that is basically not at all binding in nature advisory jurisdiction basically means seeking the legal opinion of this particular court if any organ any international organization any member country any party wants to seek the legal opinion of the international court of justice then they can refer that legal question to the bench of judges and uh, judges would give opinion to uh, the uh, you know seeking party and as a result that opinion is totally uh, non binding in nature it is totally uh, non binding and the country or the organ or the organization may or may not accept that now if we talk about the enforcement of the judgments of the uh, international court of justice then the united nation charter clearly mentions that all the judgments of the international court of justice would be enforced by the united nation security council so this is one of the most important functions of the united nation security council that they are the protectors of the global system they are the protectors of the law order and justice how that you know if some judgment is passed by the international court of justice then that needs to be enforced by the united nation security council if any country does not agree to implement the binding judgment for example india and pakistan comes under the contentious jurisdiction and the binding judgment has been passed by the international court of justice now let us say that you know 
uh, international court of justice says that the execution of kulbushan jadav cannot be conducted and kulbushan jadav should be sent back to india let us assume that this was the judgment now if pakistan decides not to send back not to uh, you know uh, send back kulbushan jadav back to india then india can refer this matter to the united nations security council and united nations security council would do whatever it can to enforce the judgment of the international court of justice that is all the judgments it is the responsibility of the security council to enforce to implement all the judgments of the international court of justice however this enforcement is subject to veto power that is for example if uh, you know pakistan decides that it would not send kulbushan jadav back to india and india knocks the door of the united nations security council that look even though the judgment was binding but then also pakistan is not abiding by that judgment then china may veto that particular uh, proposal of india and uh, no action may be taken so this is one of the loophole of the international court of justice that the judgments are subject to veto that if india knocks the door of the united nations security council as the watchdog of the global peace security and justice then united nations security council can veto that proposal and you know that would enable pakistan to never implement that judgment in soul and spirit so this is it from this lesson i am uploading one more lesson after this please stay tuned so we have seen how united nations security council is actually the protectorate of the judgments of the international court of justice and how in, uh, united nations security council is entrusted with the task of enforcing the judgments of the international court of justice one of the case that i would mention here is the nicaragua versus united states 1986 it was this particular case in which the veto power of the united nations security council permanent members was actually misused to go against international court of justice and and to reduce the independence and to reduce the effectiveness of the international court of justice so there was this case between nicaragua and united states in which nicaragua had accused united states of waging a secret war against this particular country of north america and so basically this was the case in the contentious jurisdiction of the international court of justice that is both united states and nicaragua had signed a particular protocol accepting the uh, the binding jurisdiction of the international court of justice and so when the order came the order was in favor of nicaragua and united states was actually penalized and some judgment was passed now what happened was to effectively implement this judgment the matter was taken to united nations security council and in united nations security council united states used its veto to prevent the implementation of this particular judgment so effectively this judgment of the international court of justice that was passed in nicaragua versus united states 1986 never came into being never was enforced because united states misused its veto power to actually prevent itself from uh, you know implementing the order of international court of justice so this is how even though at one uh, at one hand you know united nation security council has been entrusted with this task uh, with this really important task of enforcing and implementing the judgments and to maintain peace order and justice in the global community but then also the peacekeepers the law keepers the you know the security guards of the world are actually misusing their powers to go against the judicial process so this is how the uh, veto power was actually misused and the icj's authority the international court of justice authority was undermined now if we move ahead from this particular uh, united nations security council dimension then coming back again to the diplomatic standoff between united kingdom and india and the competition that took place in the general assembly as well as the security council so now we would look at that particular uh, subject from the mains examination point of view and what are the multilateral dimensions as far as this particular contest between united kingdom and india is concerned so first of all the fact the very fact that india from day one from round one of voting secured uh, you know overwhelming majority in the united nation general assembly it shows that the influence of united kingdom is actually reducing and this showed how the importance of india the strategic importance of india is actually increasing if we talk about the uh, you know the global arena so basically this also shows the success of the diplomacy the uh, rigorous foreign policy that has been undertaken by prime minister narendra modi most of the african nations most of the 54 55 african nations voted in favor of india and also this reflects the change in the power equation the change in the power dimensions that 
post world war 2 definitely usa uk and france all these nations were really powerful and these nations dominated the global arena these nations actually guided the global agenda and all the matters that were being taken up at the united nations but this particular vote in the united nations general assembly actually depicts that now the power balance is shifting now the emerging economies the emerging countries like india and china are playing a greater role as far as the global agenda is concerned and so this also calls for the reforms in the united nations security council and also you united nations at large so that the current global realities can be reflected so this was a clear cut indication this was a clear cut signal to the p5 members that they should also collaborate and coordinate with the rest of the world so that the meaningful Uh, reforms in the united nations can be carried out and you know the relevance of the security council can be maintained in the current global scenario so this shows that how the importance of the united kingdom is actually going down and even after brexit you know the united kingdom is losing its diplomatic sheen that it had uh, uh, in the period after the second world war these are the multilateral dimensions now if we come to the bilateral dimensions and some strategic thinkers were of the opinion that this particular standoff between united kingdom and india may impact the bilateral ties but this is not so basically because in the post brexit era britain needs india and china more than ever before basically after uh, uh, post brexit basically the market of the united uh, european union would not be accessible to uh, britain and also to recover its you know economic luster and all the shine of its economy and to increase its economic growth it would be relying more upon the asian nations such as china and india so basically because of that reason united kingdom needs india more than ever before and also apart from that recently the uh, in april 2018 the commonwealth heads of government meeting would be held in uh, united kingdom and prince charles was recently in india to specially invite prime minister narendra modi for that particular meeting because as far as this particular meeting is concerned the commonwealth heads of government meeting is concerned so in this meeting india has stayed away and it has been touted as the club for white people no meaningful talks have taken place since its existence and so you know due to the post brexit crisis and to revive its economy and to revive its growth the united kingdom is now looking to gather the support for this particular grouping and so it is uh, collaborating with india closely so that prime minister narendra modi and other nations of asia may collaborate meaningfully in this particular organization and so that uh, the uh, uh, the post brexit era may be smooth as far as the economic situation in britain is concerned so if we talk about the post brexit scenario then there would not be any Uh, oh sorry uh, if we talk about the bilateral relation then due to the post brexit era and because of the compulsions of united kingdom there would not be any significant change in equation between india and united kingdom as far as the bilateral dimension is concerned now what would be the way forward for india now if we have achieved such a big diplomatic victory at the united nations then what would be the way forward for india as far as united nations is concerned so we have already discussed that this uh, particular victory was a clear cut uh, signal of the change in the power equation that india which is an ordinary member of the united nations has actually defeated the one of the permanent members of the united nations security council and so this calls for urgent reforms and uh, re uh, reformation and change in the united nations and united nations security council in particular and as a result of that india should invest uh, invest its energy in g4 which is basically a group of india brazil germany and japan that was formed to push the agenda for the reformation of the united nations security council so india should rigorously take up the agenda for uh, reforms with other countries and particularly the g4 countries also uh, you know the african summit the close collaboration between india and the african nations and also the indian ocean and the pacific ocean nations the island nations that has proved to be very beneficial because each of these countries have one vote in the general assembly and it was because of the diplomatic outreach to these countries only that we have been able to pull off such a victory against one of the permanent members of the united nations security council so india should look into invest more into the diplomacy uh, diplomacy with other nations so that the uh, reforms for the united nations security council can be undertaken so i hope all the aspects of the united nations and the international court of justice are clear to you if you have any doubt you can please mention it in the comment section thank you very much